you have your Bibles with you, turn with me. We're going to be in the book of Revelation. We have been there. We've been looking at the seven churches the last number of weeks. We have uh, one more church to cover, but we're going to we're going to resume that when Bible study resumes again in a couple of weeks. I want to return back to something I briefly made mention of last week. Um, taught a little bit more on Friday nights and. Um, I want to kind of focus our attention this morning on the next major event that's going to happen on God's prophetic calendar for the church. Um, This event could happen at any moment. There is no precursor that is necessary. Nothing needs to take place at any moment uh, for this next event on God's prophetic calendar to take place. I'm speaking of uh, the rapture of the church. Um, I, I, I titled my message uh, a couple of Fridays ago, um, called it, When's the Believe in Leaving? <laughs> when's the Believe in Leaving? Or when are the saints soaring? Right? I want to talk about when is the church leaving the earth? And, and I want to talk a little bit about this, um, this idea of the rapture uh, this morning. Again, I addressed it um, on Friday night. I want to go into a little bit more detail um, or a different angle this morning and encourage you to um, go onto our website and and um, you can you can catch the whole teaching there as well. But uh, we use the word rapture to communicate the, um, the the catching away that Paul makes reference to in First Thessalonians uh, chapter four, or the or the taking away of the church that he makes reference to. Now there are there are two phases to Christ's coming. Um, there is the rapture of the church, and then there is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Sandwiched between those two events, there is the seven-year great tribulation where God will pour out his wrath on the earth. And so the next event that could happen in any moment without any precursor, any warning, no signs need to take place, at any moment, the rapture can take place. And it is, this, it is the, these two phases that make up the, the second coming, or the, make up the, the return of Christ. The, in the rapture, Christ will return for his church. And in the second coming, the, Christ will return with his church. And we've been going through the book of Revelation and kind of looking at this timeline that um, helps make sense of, of the events of Revelation and the way and the order in which they are laid out before us. And, and so, um, again, we look at chapter 1. It's, we see the context of what is going on. John is on the island of Patmos. He has this vision. He sees the Lord. And so we have the context of what is going on. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, it is um, it's referring to the church age. Jesus is something to say to the churches, the churches that were there at that time, as well as all the churches that exist within the church age. The church age began in the book of Acts and it will conclude when Christ raptures the church off the earth. Chapters 4 and 5 are very interesting because now we see the church that was present in chapter 2 and 3. The church is now before the throne of God. And so we recognize the church is now off the scene and the, and the church is worshiping the Lord in chapter 4 and 5. And so we recognize that the only thing that can remove the church as a whole from the earth at that time is the rapture of the church. As we get into um, chapters 6 through chapters 18, we see laid out before us the great tribulation, that period of time that will last seven years where God's wrath will come upon the church. That'll, that'll encompass all of chapter 6 through 18. As we get to chapter 19, we see the second coming of Jesus Christ. As we get to chapter 20, we see the, the millennial period, the millennium period, as well as the judgments. And as we get to chapter 21 and 22, we see the eternal state, the new heaven, the new earth, those who have rejected Christ uh, and, 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 and Satan and the false prophet and, the, and all of those fallen angels will be cast into the lake of fire and those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ will spend eternity forever and ever in the presence of the Lord uh, on this new heaven and this new earth and we will forever be with the Lord. And so that is the book of Revelation. And I think where confusion oftentimes comes in is when people do that rush, you know, the, uh, the Bible roulette, you know, they just kind of open up the book of Revelation, they jump in chapter eight, and they're like, this doesn't make any sense. 
Well, it wasn't meant to be read like that. There is a, there's a timeline, there's a sequence of events that helps us to make sense of that. And so this morning, what we're going to focus on is the rapture of the church. It is the next event that is, that is to happen prior to um, the great tribulation that is to come on the earth. And, and there's a couple of texts that I want us to kind of take a look at this morning. Um, and, and then we're going to go back and, and, and kind of um, unpack one of them a little bit more extensively to kind of see what we can learn about this, the nature of the rapture. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And Paul is writing in verse 13. He writes, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Anytime that's referring to those who are dead. Um, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. I love that. Paul puts right into context that those who die in Christ, we have a hope beyond the grave. It, our hope doesn't die with us, but there is another event that is to come for the child of God. We don't grieve like the world grieves as those who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. I like that. The word there, it means to, to take up forcefully or quickly. It's a, it's, a, it's a quick moment of exit. Those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And Paul says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now we're going to go back to 1 Thessalonians and, 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 and unpack that a little bit more. But before we do, let's just take another, uh, let's take a look at another passage of Scripture that makes reference to this, uh, to the rapture of the church um, perhaps it's a familiar passage of scripture to you. John chapter 14. Take a look with me at John chapter 14. It is, it is, um, it is perhaps days before Jesus is uh, betrayed um, and handed over and arrested and crucified. Uh, it is at that moment um, where, where you know, Jesus had been talking a lot about soon he was going to be uh, taken away. And, and, he, and he looks at his disciples, and clearly there was uh, concern on their faces as they know that this one that they walked with, right, was soon to be leaving them. And Jesus says to them in John chapter 14 and verse 1, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again, and here it is, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. I like that. I'm going and I'm preparing a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. It's very interesting here. There is no reference, and when we read in Revelation chapter 20, and we consider uh, the second coming of Christ, we recognize that when Christ comes to the earth, he's going to come, and he's going to set up his kingdom here on the earth. That's what Revelation chapter 20 talks about. But that's not what Jesus is saying in John chapter 14. And here he's saying, and I'm coming, and I'm going to take you to myself. There's no mention of this kingdom being set up at this point. As we look also in, um, in Revelation, we also recognize that it is at that time that Christ will bring judgment on the earth during the second coming, and yet there's no record or no mention of that in this passage either. It's this idea that Christ is going to come and take us 
to be with him forever so that where I am, you may be also. Isn't that comforting words? Don't you love the heart of Jesus? That what drives Jesus is his love for you and me to take him to himself so that we can be with the Lord forever. In death, we go to him. But in the rapture, he comes to us. And what Jesus is laying out for his disciples in John chapter 14 and for all of us who would read on is if I'm going to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and I will take you to myself. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Paul writes, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. In other words, this isn't going to make any sense to you. This is going to be hard for you to wrap your arms around. This is a mystery that will be revealed and make more sense when we're on the other side or when, when what is written intersects with that moment. And then it'd be like, oh, it's no longer a mystery. But we kind of see, uh, when we read this, there's... There's a, there's a mystery that's connected to this. Jesus said, I behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. He's referring to our death. He's saying, we sh- you shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death, Paul writes, is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of that, my beloved brothers, because of that, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Notice what Paul is saying here. He says that we shall not all sleep. In other words, there's going to be a generation of Christians. We don't know which generation it's going to be. How many hope it's us, but we don't know, right? There's going to be a generation of Christians that don't die. That in the midst of doing their day to day, in the midst of living out their lives on mission, the trumpet's going to sound and Christ is going to call the church to himself. And it's going to be quick. He says, we shall not all sleep. We shall not all die but we all will be changed. How soon? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. That's an event that's going to happen very, very quickly. And look what he says here. The dead will be raised imperishable. We shall be changed. Look, for this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality because the bodies in which we are living in, they're not able to endure all of eternity. How many have realized that you're struggling with it making it through right now? I think things seem to be breaking down a little bit, right? It's just like you didn't have as much, you know, as much of a kick in your step as you used to have one day. You're thinking, I don't know if I'm going to make it another 10, 15 years in this thing. How in the world am I going to make it all throughout eternity? We're going to get a new body. And it's not going to be in decline. It's not going to be weak. It's going to be created to endure all of eternity. This perishable must put on imperishableness. This mortal must put on immortality. And then we'll see, the, see what it says. Death is swallowed up in victory. The death of sin is what's deteriorating our bodies. But we're going to defeat that in Jesus. And we're going to live forever in the presence of the Lord. Paul is sending an encouragement bomb to the church and saying, man, it doesn't stop here for you. There's more yet to come. Therefore, he said, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. 
Don't let anybody move you from this truth. Don't let circumstances knock you off of your foundation and your hope that you have in Jesus. You be steadfast. You be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that it's not in vain. Your hope is not in vain. Notice the contrast that we see between the rapture of the faithful and the second coming of Christ. Many would suggest that the, the rapture of the church or the texts that are used to describe the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus are one and the same, that there is not a rapture of the church, that it seems to them, many of them, to be just too sensationalized, as if Jesus coming through the clouds in the second coming is any, you know, less of a feat, but okay then. Um, but if we, if we were to look at the texts that refer to the rapture, uh, we would see that there is a clear distinction uh, or a contrast that is made between the rapture of the faithful and the second coming of Jesus. In 1 in first Thessalonians chapter 4, we see that Christ comes for his own. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 14, it says that Christ will come with his own. Big difference between the two. The only way to come with is at some point they had to get there, right? We see in, when Jesus is talking to his disciples in John chapter 14, it says, it, it says that Jesus says, believers will be taken to the Father's house. But when we think about, when we, when we read about the, the second coming of Christ, we recognize that Christ is going to set up his kingdom right here on this earth. We are going to rule and reign with Jesus on this earth. There won't be a taking away. There'll be a staying period of time. We'll be on this earth, back on this earth, because we'll have been raptured out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, we recognize that, that the coming of Christ is only going to be seen by believers. Could you imagine what that's going to be like? For all the world to recognize all of a sudden the church is gone? I remember years ago watching some uh, interview on some channel or whatever, and they were interviewing this woman who uh, claimed to be a medium, and she um, would channel um, people or personalities that were from out of space, aliens, and she would speak, they would speak through to this woman. And I, it obviously caught my attention. I'm thinking, this is kind of weird. And, but she said this, she said that, that the world is going to change. Everything's going to be completely different. And the people that go against the change that's coming, the aliens are going to take them off the earth. And I thought, that's going to be their excuse for the rapture. Because they've got to make sense of the fact that the church automatically, you know, it just leaves, right? And it's going to be chaos. There's going to be disorder. There's going to be fear. There's going to be turmoil. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be need of some kind of a antichrist to come and bring some peace to the world. Interesting. You see, but the, the, the coming of Jesus is only going to be seen by believers in 1 Corinthians 15. But Jesus, but, Matthew, but Jesus talks about all the world seeing him in Matthew 24 and verse 30. All will fix their eyes on him. We recognize that in, the, in, in, in these texts of the rapture, the earth is not judged at this point. Jesus takes the church and brings them to his father. And yet in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, we see the earth is clearly judged. And so there's, a, there's these two events that are taking place. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, if this will occur in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, how do you, how do you capture a, a, on, on a timeline the, the, the expanse of time that a blink takes? It occurs in a twinkling of an eye. And yet, when we read Revelation chapter 16, Jesus comes to the earth to do battle at a very specific location in Revelation 16, 16, we see the battle of Armageddon. And so we see again, two very different um, scenarios of what's going to be playing out at this moment. In 1 Thessalonians chapter four and 16, Jesus descends with a shout. In Revelation chapter 19, 11, 21, there is no shout mentioned. And so there's clearly a, a, a contrast, a distinction, these two events that make up the coming of Jesus, the rapture of the church where Christ will come for his church, and then the second coming when Christ will come with his church. 
Now, Paul's letter to the church of Thessalonians um, gives us perhaps the clearest picture of this event that is uh, yet to come. I want to highlight a couple of things over in that. And so if you want to jump back over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, I want to take a look at this event, the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We see a couple of things in this text that help us to understand what this event will be like. First and foremost, we see that that Christ's return will be personal. He is the one going to come. Verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, of the command, a cry of command with the voice of an archangel. The Lord himself, I love this. Paul is letting us know that this same Jesus that has been revealed to us in the Gospels, this same Jesus who has saved us from our sins, this same Jesus who walked our dusty roads, this same Jesus who was, who was nailed to a cross, this same Jesus who was placed into a tomb, this same Jesus who was risen from the dead, this same Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout. It is not a, he is not going to send somebody on his behalf. He is coming himself. It will not be a mystical Jesus. Some have said, well, Jesus already came. No, he didn't. We wouldn't be here. Amen. It is not going to be a mystical Jesus or an invisible Jesus. It will not be some event that the, the whole world, indeed the whole church, doesn't become aware of. But it will be this same Jesus that walked our dusty roads, who still bears the marks on his hands and his feet, those love marks for the redemption of the world. Christ's return will be personal. I just want you to know Christ takes you very personal. He loves you very personally. His return will be very personal. Secondly, secondly, Christ's return will be sudden. It will be very quick. It will be very unexpected, unlike the second coming that makes references to, to many signs and, and that, that, that will surround that event. As you read through, through Matthew 23 and 24 and part of 25, we recognize that there are a lot of signs that, that will help us to recognize that, that Christ's second coming is soon. In fact, Jesus said, when you see all these things, look up, your redemption draws nigh. But that wasn't written to us. We won't be here for that event. That's written to the people who came to Christ during the tribulation, who needed some encouragement when it seemed like all hell was breaking loose and that came to faith during that period of time. And what Jesus is doing is giving very clear signs that when you see all these things, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. But for the rapture, there are no signs. There is nothing to look to. If you're waiting for a sign to say, well, you know, I don't really need to get serious with God until I see A, B, and C happen. Listen, let this serve as your sign this morning. Jesus can come at any moment, and we must be ready. Amen. Look what he says in, verse, uh, in, in chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Say, oh, come on, pastor, you're scaring me. I didn't write this. This is what the book says. Let him who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May we get hold of the grace of God in this hour that we live where it's available to each and every one of us. Don't put off to tomorrow thinking you're promised tomorrow. Christ's return will be sudden. Thirdly, we see the dead in Christ will rise first. Somebody asked me, he said, wait a minute, so all the people who died in Christ, have they been in the grave all this time? Well, their bodies were, but their spirits were with the Lord. And so there's going to be a reuniting of their, of their body with their spirit. And so if, you're, if you're, you're, you've got loved ones who have gone on before you, they're not in the grave waiting in, in this like limbo stage. They're certainly not in purgatory, by the way. Uh, there is no such place. 
Um, and so where are they? Their spirits are in the presence of the Lord, but their bodies are in the ground. But there'll be a moment where we see, it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. For this we declare to you by, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, they're going to go first and we're going to go second. Age before beauty. They're going to go first, and we're going to go second. What an amazing event this is going to be. Think about this. All of those who, who died in Christ, as well as those who died prior to Christ's coming, those who trusted in the, the systems and the sacrifices that God put in place for them, as, as, as God as, as speaks of Andrew, Abraham, who obeyed God and was accounted unto him for righteousness. And so those who have gone on before us, they will go first, and then we will soon follow. Let's just highlight the miracle of that. I mean, because after a period of time, our bodies are but dust, which is what we were created of with from, the, from the beginning, right? And there will be a, there will be a coming together of these physical bodies. That's crazy. But that's exactly what we see the scripture saying. Maybe many people have asked me, Pastor, is, is, is cremation wrong? No, whether you turn to ashes or dust over a period of time, you're still gonna be spread out all over the place. And just a personal point of view, it's, it's a whole lot more money to go through that whole thing. Um, and, but people feel guilty thinking, thinking they're doing the wrong thing. And so they'll preserve the body. You might get an extra 40 years out of it, but in the end of the day, it's still going to be worm food. Yeah. And you just spent $20,000. Just saying. <laughs> what a miracle that's going to be. I figure this, man, if, 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 I mean, if this is going to be a miracle, man, spread me out all over the world. I want, I, want, I want a piece of ash coming from every corner of the earth, right? If we're going to go miracle, let's go big or go home, right? And just let's like, get it all together. But it's going to be an incredible event. And what's going to happen is those who have gone on before us, they will go up. And and again, this is all happening within a moment and a twinkling of an eye. They're going to go, and then we're going to go right behind them. And we will meet them with the Lord in the air. Can you imagine like the high fives and the excitement and and the sense of reunion as the church has come together under the head, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for us. Oh, that's great. It's the hope of our salvation. It's what awaits. That's why Paul said, man, encourage one another with these words. So we also see, so we, we will follow those who have died in Christ. That's number four. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together within the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. For those of you who have the loved ones that have gone on ahead of you, there's a reunion coming. There's a reunion coming. There's not one that's been lost that has placed their faith in Jesus. They await that moment. And when we cross over out of this realm of time and we're in the presence of Jesus and all of those loved ones, what a great day of reunion, a gathering of the saints in the presence of God. And then look, we also see number five, we'll be with Jesus forever forever. It's a term that we just, we just can't wrap our arms around. Just when we think we are starting to understand it, we've only defined perhaps the beginning of it. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Our limited minds cannot understand this thing called forever, but we, we don't need to, um, uh, we, we don't want to be robbed of that hope, for it awaits all of those who place their trust in Jesus. We will be forever with Jesus. It is the fulfillment of Jesus' word to his disciples. I'm going and I'm preparing a place for you so that where I am, 
you may be also. I will come and I will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. It is the grand design for what God always intended for us to experience. God created us to be in relationship with him. God created us to to walk with him, creator in creation, in in a loving uh, relationship, to enjoy all that God has created and all that God is, and sin got in there and twisted and distorted and robbed us of those things. But Jesus stepped in, and he reverses the curse for us. It was the reversal of what was lost in the garden. The curse from the first Adam that kept us from relationship with God is reversed by Jesus, the second Adam. And because of that, we will forever be with the Lord as we turn to him and recognize that that he alone is the only means by which I can be saved. It is not my good works. It is not anything I can do. It is everything that he has done for me. And when I abandon everything that I was holding onto to kind of get me into the other side, whether that be works, whether that be a church or some religious system, all of those things are, are going to be null and void. The only thing that's going to get us onto the other side is putting our faith in what Jesus did for us on Calvary. That's why the cross is so monumental in our lives. What happened on Calvary is as significant as what happened in the garden. It is the reversing of the curse so that man might enjoy his creator forever. That's what the psalmist wrote about He says in Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. That's what God's created us for. There's much speculation as to whether this rapture is going to happen. Like when's it going to happen? Is it going to be a a pre-tribulation rapture? In other words, is the rapture going to happen before the tribulation? Is it going to be mid-tribulation rapture? Is it going to happen during the tribulation? Is it going to happen after the tribulation, right? There's always a lot of conversation about those things. And let me just kind of say unapologetically, I hold my conviction from what I see in the word of God is that it is going to be a pre-tribulation rapture that prior to the church, prior to God's wrath being poured out on the earth, the church is going to be removed off the seen. And let me tell you why I believe that. When mentioning the great tribulation, as we look at that period of time from Revelation chapter 6 to chapter 18, this great tribulation, 11 times this great tribulation is referred to as the wrath of Almighty God directly. Many more times indirectly it is referred to as the wrath of God, but it is very clearly 11 times where what's coming on the earth is the wrath of Almighty God. And I believe with all my heart that as a disciple of Jesus Christ, he has absorbed the wrath of God already for me on the cross, and I have sidestepped that. There is no wrath that is going to come upon the church of Jesus Christ Because when Christ said, it is finished, he absorbed all the wrath of God that was directed towards us, and in so doing, he turned God's wrath towards us into God's favor towards us. Last week, we looked at the church of Philadelphia, and we saw the promise that Jesus made to the church of Philadelphia in uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. Jesus said, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. What we see here, unlike all of the other um, moments where Jesus made, um, uh, was, was aware or made notice of the persecution and the trials that they were enduring, this is different. The churches and the other, the, the other churches were experiencing tribulation and persecution from the world around them because of their faith. But what Jesus, what Jesus says here is there's a trial that's coming upon the whole world. This is a tribulation. It is the wrath of God. And Jesus is saying, because of your patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming upon the whole earth. And it is just after that, the church is off the scene 
And that hour of trial, the great tribulation, chapter 6 through 18, comes upon the earth. Interestingly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the same, the same letter that Paul addresses, that, that text that we just look at in the rapture, Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 9. At first, he, 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 he um, commends them, says, For they themselves report concerning us the, great, the kind reception, reception we have had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, look, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. It is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. He mentions that just two, three chapters prior to this whole, um, uh, this whole text about the rapture. And then right after chapter 4, we look at chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, and Paul writes, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so listen, there was a point at which you and I were under the wrath of God. But as we put our trust in Jesus Christ, Christ took that wrath upon himself for you and for me. Now let me just say this. I recognize that the church has never been exempt from hardship. Many will say, well, I, I, I think the church is going to go through it because, and I've heard it, and so have you. Well, God always brings his people through the hard times. He brought the children of Israel through the wilderness. He talked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through the fiery furnace. He left, brought Daniel through the lion's den. God doesn't deliver his people. He always brings them through that, and I get that. There's always, the church has never been exempt from hardship. The church has never been exempt from persecution. But this event is not describing, this great tribulation is not describing persecution from, without, from, from unbelievers. This event is speaking of the wrath of Almighty God. He is the source of that. And the same way that God's wrath came upon the earth in the days of Noah, God delivered Noah from that moment, didn't he? He didn't bring Noah through that. He spared him from the destruction of the world. In the same way that God's wrath was poured out on Egypt, God gave them a plan. You put the blood on the doorpost and I will spare you. When I see the blood, I will spare you from the wrath to come. And likewise for you and me, we've had the blood of Jesus applied to the doorpost of our hearts and we will be spared from the wrath that is to come. And then again, just look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 18. After he lays out this whole, this whole passage about the rapture, he says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I don't know about you, but if it was like, if I had to go through the tribulation, there's nothing really very encouraging about that. Read chapter 6 through 18. Let me tell you something. You're not going to find anything very encouraging for the church. Especially because in chapter 6 through 18, you don't even see the church mentioned. You see people who come to faith during that time in Christ. Many of the Jews' eyes will be open and 144,000 of them will, will, will respond in faith to Jesus. But I don't take great, it would be not very encouraging to think that I've got to you know, encourage one another with these words. It's going to get really hard. No. Encourage one another with these words because the wrath that is coming upon the world, not from the world, but from God himself, has been something that is not directed towards his people. It was directed towards his people, but Christ absorbed it all on himself. It wasn't like God cleaned the slate and said, I won't, have, I won't have wrath towards you. No, he poured it all out on his son. So what do we do with this? I mean, at any moment, Christ can come. At any moment. Nothing has to happen. Nothing has to take place. You say, well, what about Israel? Oh, Israel is an incredible timepiece to give us an idea of when the second coming is going to happen. Let me tell you something. It seems like the stage is really being set for the second coming. But before the second coming, the rapture is going to take place and the church is going to be gone. So if you think we're close to the second coming, let me tell you something. We're about seven years sooner in the rapture. So what do we do with that? Number one, we be ready. Be ready. I mean, the what is the rapture. The so what is, what do we do about it? Well, be ready. 
keep our hearts and our minds clear and sensitive to God's leading and direction in our lives, make sure our priorities and our hearts are right before God, that we're not being busy and distracted and consumed with the things of the world, that it's keeping us from the things of God. Have our hearts ready. I pray to God I'm preaching my best message the day the trumpet sounds. I just hope that. Be ready. Because at any moment, what at that point is going to be any more important than that moment? Secondly, be missional. Recognize that, that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, as Paul says. We have been called to bring the gospel to the world around us. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. It has the ability to take that which was dead and make alive again. We are to be missionaries, see ourselves, recognizing we are ambassadors for Jesus in our workplace, in our community, in our families, busy doing kingdom work. Everything we do ought to be looked at through the lens of how does this impact the kingdom of God? You say, come on, Pastor, that's crazy. No, that's biblical. That's what, that's what it means to have our lives hidden in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, that's when, that's when words move from theory to reality. If it's Christ who lives in me, then how would Jesus work on my job? How would Jesus move within my family? How would Jesus impact the people around me? That's what we're called to do. That's what we need to look. We need to be Jesus to the world around us. Be missional. And then thirdly, be encouraged. Find great encouragement in these words, because ready, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. It's, that fact is not even close. Jesus is the hero in the story. Nothing, no circumstance, no person, nothing is going to change God's plan. That the same one who saved you is the one who's going to carry you across the finish line. Be encouraged. He that began a good work in you, he's going to complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He's invested a lot in you. And it's for good. And when it feels like nobody believes in you, maybe you don't even believe in yourself, I want you to know Jesus believes in you. Because he's, he's made a deposit into your spirit. And that which he has started, he's going to complete unto the day of Jesus Christ. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you I'm going to prepare a place? But I go and prepare a place so that I might take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for what lies ahead for the child of God, for the saint of God. Lord, forgive us for those times that we have allowed the cares of of, of this world, the busyness of life, for the times that we've allowed our priorities to not reflect who we are and where we're going. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to see that you have given us this incredible gift. Lord, may we be lights in the world around us. May we be salt in the world. May we be ambassadors for Jesus to bring the gospel. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I'm just, I need to get some things right. I'm, I don't want to be ashamed on that day. The blood of Christ has been shed so that we can be forgiven of our sins. If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't, nobody has to walk out of here with anything less than a clean slate. A clean slate washed in the blood of Jesus. And if that's you, just pray, God, forgive me. Lord, change me. Help me to prioritize the things of God in our life. We thank you that he that began a good work will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. 
that your word is not to make us feel guilty, but it's to inform us that we might grow into the full stature of Jesus Christ so that we can experience all the blessings and good things you have for us. I pray, Lord, that this would not come across in a message of condemnation, but of tremendous hope that we have in Jesus. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen.